Okay, y'all, let's get started. It is, we're in the home stretch now. It's just two classes to go. And we will be finishing up with the, um, actually, before, let me figure out how to get this. It's never happened to me before. There we go. Okay. So we're finishing up AVL trees today. We have uh, analysis of the running time of programs on Tuesday. And then we have the exam on uh, Thursday, a week from today. And even though the exam period would start at 8, I am actually going to start the final at 8.45 because it's only meant to be a midterm. So yes, you. Um, the exam will start at 8.45, so if you show up at 8, I will not be here, and, uh, but I will be here at 8.45. So the exam is only cumulative in the sense that I expect you to know all of the data structures we covered this semester, and I expect you to be able to, uh, given a um, problem description, tell me which data structure you would select, much like you had to do in the second midterm. So other than that, the final is going to cover recursion. It's going to cover, so it will be covering recursion. It will cover binary search trees. It will cover AVL trees. And it will cover the running time of programs. Again, we will get to the running time of programs on Tuesday. So. You already yesterday had your programming portion, and that pretty much covered a lot of what we'll do with recursion. On um, the midterm, or on the final however, make sure that you can read recursive code. Okay, and there's a number of ways that that might come into play. I might ask you what is wrong with the code. So I might say, what is wrong? Fix. So just, you've done this before on the other exams. I would anticipate something like that on this one too. A short recursive function meant to do something. Something about the code is wrong. You need to fix it. Second type of thing is asking you to show me what the stack frames look like. So um, show stack frames. Okay, back when we, if you're wondering what the heck, well, we covered that back when we were at the very beginning of recursion. So back on November 6th, right after the midterm, and at the very beginning of those recursion notes, we went over what stack frames would look like. Okay. So they would be the name of the function, the line that's executing when it calls a recursive function, and the values of any local variables, including parameters. So I might give you a call and tell you, for example, at the point where you reach the base case, what does the stack contents look like? So here you had a very simple recursive function. If I was 10, it called A9, otherwise it returned. So when calling A10, A10 ends up calling A9. A9 is the last instance because um, I is not equal to 10, so it will return. So the stack at that point looks like this. You have main at line 9. You have A4 at line 4. It, let's see. At line four, it called A9. And finally, in the last one, you have I equals nine. You're at line four, and it's returning. So that's what I mean by you need to be able to read recursive code and show me the stack frames. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. Okay. So for binary search trees, it's going to be more conceptual. So you need to be able to create one from scratch, 
draw one from scratch. So if I give you a set of values to insert, you should be able to create one from scratch. You should be able to delete a node. Okay, for AVL trees, you need, oh, and for BS trees, you need to be able to tell me what leads to the worst case, okay? What causes the worst case? Does anyone remember what causes the worst case for a binary search tree? Inserting in sorted order causes it to become a linear linked list, completely unbalanced. Okay, so AVL trees, okay, the reason we do them is because they guarantee balance. They rebalance the tree after every insert, every delete, so they guarantee order log n performance. Okay, that cannot be said for ordinary balanced, or I'm sorry, for ordinary binary search trees. And you need to be able to know how to insert and delete. And of course, you need to know how to rebalance using rotations. So you also need to know how to do rotations. So obviously, you will need to know how to rotate. And while we have not gotten and we'll be getting through the end of insert and delete today, so don't worry if you're wondering. We haven't gotten all the way through insert. We had not gotten to delete. And finally, with the running time of algorithms, you'll be given code fragments. and asked to compute their big O running times. Okay, there's a sample exam. You can see what that looks like. And of course, we'll be going over it on Tuesday as well. And then finally, in addition to these four items, so one, two, three, and four, the last thing you need to be able to do is you need to, given various scenarios, select the best data structure. So that means you better know what the big O running times are for the data structures we went over. So maps, sets, hash tables, link lists, vectors, so on and so forth. And you need to know the situations where they apply or don't apply. So for example, hash tables are more efficient than sets and maps. But if I require that the data be kept in sorted order for some reason, then you're going to have to use a set or a map. So questions about this. This is kind of a very good outline of what you need to be studying for the paper version of the exam. Okay? And otherwise, it is just like the other two midterms. The points are the same, so 60 points coding, 90 points will be the paper, total 150 points. You'll be graded out of 150. Okay, I got a good question. The uh, sample exam said it was 120 points. You'd be graded out of 100. I think that that semester, something like 80% of the students had A's because that just really skewed everything um, the wrong way. That may have been the first time I taught the course uh, recently. I didn't realize what that would do. So. After that, I changed the extra credit to be on the labs. So that's where you get the extra credit these days. And that brings me to that second announcement. There is a new Canvas link up for your 10 eval or 10 voice evaluations. If you submit proof that either a PDF file or a .png file or a JPEG, upload that to that Canvas link and you'll get 30 extra points on 
your lab grade. Do not send it to me. Upload it on Canvas. Okay. And final announcement. A uh, student asked about um, the pre-class and after-class activities. Notice that it seemed like some of their grades were being dropped. That is true. On the pre-class activities, three, your three lowest grades are dropped. On your after-class activities, your two lowest grades are dropped. Okay, and that just takes account of the fact, busy semester, things happen. I know you can't necessarily do them each and every time, or maybe it's just a bad day, something goes wrong, you get a bad result. So three drop for the pre-class, two for the post-class. I will uh, try to have the exams graded by next Wednesday. See no reason why that shouldn't be the case, which means going into the exam on Thursday, you should have a pretty good idea of where you stand. I know you haven't gotten every lab grade back, but you did, you know from the scripts roughly how you're doing on those labs. So you should have a pretty good idea once you have the coding portion uh, graded where you stand in the course. Okay? Yes? Yes, still ends at 10. So it's an hour 15 minutes. It's just like the midterm, okay? It's uh, not meant to, and because you've already had the coding portion, it's not meant to take you the entire hour 15. It may, but it's not meant to. Other questions? Okay. So, where we ended last time, or on the videotaped lecture, was talking about inserting into a AVL tree. And just a quick review, if you have an AVL tree that looks something like, say, this, this is not balanced. Now, I know the book used something called balance factors. I want you to use heights the way it's done in the lecture notes. Okay, so two different ways of doing it, the lecture notes approach, the book approach. So we employ a height approach. So using a height approach, the height of a leaf node is zero, which, and the height of a empty child is minus one. So the height of this one is one. The height of this one is two. The height of its left child, since it's empty, is minus one. So right here we have an imbalance and we would need to fix it. And at the end of the last lecture, we said that this was a case where we had a zigzag. Okay, it zigs and then it zags. And the way we fixed that was with a double rotation about what node? Does anyone remember what the double rotation occurs about? About what? It occurs actually about 70. So when you have the zigzag case, okay, the double rotation is in general about the grandchild of the node where the imbalance occurs. So in this case, the imbalance is about is 50 because that's the first place where its two children differ by a height of more than one. Okay, so zigzag case, the double rotation is about the grandchild of the node. So in this case, the first rotation is to rotate 80 down. So you're going to end up with 80 rotating down and becoming the right child of 70. And then the second rotation brings 50 down, and you end up with that tree right there. Okay. When I do it, I like to, I find it easiest to do two single rotations. But if you prefer, you could also memorize it. So this was a specific example. The more general case is shown in the notes.
Okay, so that's a zigzag. You want the zigzag. So here's the more general case for a zigzag. So the node that we are going to have a imbalance about is B. Okay, and you have actually that's before the insertion. After the insertion, you've inserted into D's tree, and we're assuming that you insert it further. Oh, come on. How did that end up? Just a sec. I'm looking for zigzag, not zigzag. There we go, zigzag. Okay, sorry. So we have inserted into one of the two subtrees of D, either C or E. Okay, and the imbalance is at B. It's the first place where the heights differ by two. So you see H minus three here, H minus one here. So for example, if H were eight, that would mean this is a five. I'm sorry. Yes, this is a seven. And that is a five, so their heights differ by two. And with a zigzag, it's always the case that you go one direction and then the opposite direction, hence zigzag. So we don't know whether the insert occurred in tree C or in tree E, but we know it occurred in one of the two. Okay? So to rebalance, what we're going to do is a double rotate about whichever node actually caused the issue. Okay? So in this case, we're double rotating about the grandchild of B, and that grandchild is D. So F is going to come down and become the right child of D. B is going to come down and become the left child of D. Now you can see there's an issue. Obviously, D already has two children. So C and E are going to become orphans, and they're going to have to be adopted by the two nodes that are getting, becoming the children. So F is going to become one children, okay? And as a result of becoming a right child of D, which child of F becomes available? If F is going to become the right child of D, which child of F now becomes available? The left child, because F no longer has D as a left child. Okay? So F is going to adopt E as its left child. And that is perfectly fine because... E is already in the left subtree for F, so if we go down, we see that E is already in the left subtrees for F, so clearly everything in E is less than F. And also, E is a right child of D, and since what we're going to have at the end is something that looks like D goes to F, and then the subtree E, it should also be clear that E is greater than D, so we've still in maintained that invariant. Okay, now when we shift down B and it becomes the left child of D, what child of B becomes free? The right child. And so B is going to adopt C as its right child. And again, that's fine because... So we're going to have B and, I'm sorry, not it's, it's going to be B has as its right child C. Well, as you can see, C is down here in B's right subtree already, so making C a right child of B is fine. Everything in C is greater than B. So there's absolutely no trouble there. And D is greater than B because D is in B's right subtree. We know that D is greater than B. So the fact that D is going to become 
the parent of B, and B will be its left subchild, is no problem because B is less than D. Okay? So, if you want, if it's easier, you can simply remember that F adopts E, B adopts C, and that you get something that looks like this. Now, so C has become B's right child, and E has become F's left child. Okay? I don't like that. I normally have to work it out. Okay? So I prefer, and here he's actually done it by doing the first rotation where he brought F down. I don't think I can make it small enough. But maybe I can. Can almost make it small enough. So here, first rotation, F came down to here. So we rotate it F down. It became this right child here, and it adopted E. Okay, and then we did the second rotation where we brought B down. So B comes over here and it adopts C as its right child. Okay. As I said, I find memorization doesn't work well for me, so I always do the rotations and I memorize how to do the rotations. I find them simpler. Yes, John? Mm -hmm. So the question is, when you do this double rotation, does the child always adopt the height of the parent? And the answer, I believe, is yes. And the reason is that once you're done with this rebalancing, the, that's the only rotation you have to do. And now the tree is balanced. And the reason the tree is balanced is because the height of the subtree is not changed. That is, you rebalance that subtree that was rooted at B. As a result of the rebalancing, the height of the tree does not change. At the end, as you pointed out, um, its previous height. Now, it went up to H as a result of the insert. Okay, so its height had increased by one. So I should say it goes back to the original height of B before the insertion was performed. That's what I'm saying. Because it had already, we had done the insertion, which caused the height of B to increase by 1. And then, as a result of doing the rebalancing, it causes B to go back to its original height before the insertion occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay, And because it goes back to its original height before the insertion occurred, well, the tree was an ABL tree before the insert occurred, okay, so everything above B was fine. Wherever B was, it and its sibling, whatever, we'll just call it X, before the insert, we know that the height difference between these two was less than or equal to 1, okay? As a result of doing the rebalancing, D has moved up to replace B, but we know that the height of this subtree is still whatever it was before the insert occurred. Okay, So since it was an ABL tree before, it must still be the case that the heights differ by no more than one, and so we're good all the way, the rest of the way to the root. And that's why um, we don't have to look any further in the case of an insert. As soon as we've done a single double rotate, we're done. Okay. Now, that's not going to be the case with delete, but it is the case with insert. Okay. Okay. Now, before I tell you how you determine whether it's a zigzag or the other case, let's just look at the other possible situation that occurs when we do a insert. Okay. So, let's again say we have 50 and 70, but now let's say we insert 90. Again, we now have an imbalanced tree. If we look at the heights, this is 0, this is 1, this is 2. Okay, the height of this empty tree over here is minus 1. The 
height of this empty tree here is minus 1. These two heights differ by more than 1, so 50 has an imbalance. But we call this one a zigzag because if we look at where the imbalance is occurring, you have to go right twice in the same direction. Okay, if I instead had had 50 goes to 30 and down to 20, I would also have a zigzag issue. So it's an issue where you go in the same direction twice to get to the inserted value. And this is easier to fix. Okay, now you need a single rotate about 70 rather than a double rotate. Okay, so it is a single rotate about the child rather than the grandchild. So when you have a zig-zig situation where the insert, when you're looking at the tree and you're looking at the node that where the imbalance occurs and you're trying to uh, figure out where the inserted node is, if you have to go right the first two times, it's a zigzag. If you have to go right and then left, it's a zigzag. Okay, so you do a single rotate about the child. So the child is 70, doing a single rotate. Is simply going to move 50 down to here. So we're going to get this tree. So that's a single rotate. Questions about that? Again, that's a concrete case. Here is the more general case. You have B goes to D, and you insert into now. You know which tree here you inserted into. If it's zigzag, did you insert into tree C, or did you insert into tree F? F because it's a zigzag, okay? So in order for it to be zigzag, you have to go right twice, or you have to go left twice. If you insert it into C, it would have been a zigzag situation, okay? So you're looking at the first two levels below the node at which the imbalance occurs, and all you care about is do you go in the same direction twice, or do you go in opposite directions? If you go in the same direction twice, it's zigzag. If you go in opposite directions, it's zigzag. I'm telling you in this case it's a zigzag, so I know the insertion occurred in F. Okay? Now, the actual imbalance, however, is here at B. It's two children are some unnamed node here and D. And because it's zigzag, we're going to do our single rotation about D. So B is going to come down and become a left child of D. And as a result of that, C becomes an orphan. Because B becomes the left child of D. Therefore, C <clears throat> needs to be adopted. No problemo. Because B's right child is now empty. B can adopt, so B adopts C as a right child. Okay, and again, that works fine. C is already somewhere to the right of B, so everything in C is greater than B. So it's fine if we make C be a direct right child of B. And... Also, it's okay to make B be a left child of D because D is to the right of B, therefore B is less than D, and we can put B as a left child of D. Okay, so when we do all of that,
we end up, you actually show it. Yep. So he does his single rotation. B comes down. So right here, B is going to come down. So it's right here, it's a child of D. It's adopting C. So you can see right here that B adopted C as its right child. F still has E and G as its two. Okay, if we look at the heights of what happened, as a result of the insertion, again, B's height has gone from H minus 1 to H. Okay, so this was the situation. The heights of the two subtrees differed by 2. You can see these are the heights of all the other trees. So when we rebalance, okay, we still have E and G. None of the subtrees' heights change because they still, nothing changes in them. So the heights of A and C are still H minus 3. The heights of E and G are still H minus 3 or H minus 4. So when we're done, B is H minus 2. F is H minus 2. We knew that one of these, we haven't changed the height of F either. It still has E and G as subtrees, so the height of F remains at H minus 2. Therefore, the height of D is H minus 1. Again, that means that the height of our final subtree is the same as the height of the original subtree. When we started with the insert, B's height was H minus 1. As a result of the insert, B's height became H. Okay, after doing the rebalancing, D has now become the root of that subtree that B used to be the root of. But again, because we know that the difference originally between whatever B and X was, its sibling, we knew that its heights were less than or equal to 1. Now that D has replaced B, but its height is the same, we again know that the heights must be less than or equal to 1 and everything above us is okay. So also with a zigzag situation, we only have to do that single rotate. Once we've finished doing that rotate, our ABL tree is rebalanced and we, don't, we can immediately terminate our insert procedure. Okay? So questions about that? I'm going to do one more example, and then I'm going to let you work through an example. Okay, so here is a, let's see, where are we inserting here? We're going to insert Jasper. So here's before, and we're inserting Jasper. So Jasper goes way down here with Courtney. And the numbers you see are all the height. So We've recomputed all the heights. The only heights that have to get actually recomputed are the heights that are from the inserted node up to the parent. No other heights are going to change. So Jasper is 0. Courtney is now 1. Ingrid is 2. Garth now becomes 3. And Daisy becomes 4. Looking Going, starting at the leaf, we now work our way to the root to discover if there's any imbalance. Okay, the first, uh, the parent of Jasper is Courtney. There's no imbalance because the heights differ by one. So now we go to Courtney's parent, which is Ingrid. There's still no imbalance. Okay, so now we go to Garth. And we look at that, and we see that there is an imbalance because Garth and Binky differ by 2. So we say the imbalance is actually at Daisy, which is the parent of Garth. That's the first place, it's the first node where the two children differ by a height of more than 1. Okay. So we have to now determine 
whether we have a zigzag or a zigzag situation. So remember, the way we determine is we start at the note that has the imbalance, which is daisy. And now we figure out where the inserted node went. So if we do that, okay, to insert Jasper, Jasper is to the right of Daisy. And is Jasper to the right of Garth or the left of Garth? It's to the right. So if we look at the first two levels, it's a zig-zig, same direction. So since it's a zig-zig and the imbalance occurs at Daisy, what are we going to do? So zig-zig. Rotate about Garth, because we do, in the zigzag case, we do a single rotate about the child. The child is Garth. So, Daisy is going to come down. As you can see here, Daisy becomes the left child of Garth. And Daisy is going to adopt Garth's left subtree. It's going to become the right subtree of Daisy. So if you see over here, that left subtree of Garth became a right subtree of Daisy. Everything else is the same. If you look at all the other subtrees, they have not changed. So this subtree here exactly matches what we have over here. It's still a left subtree of Daisy. If you look at Garth's right child, okay, over here, it is still a right child of Garth. So the only thing that moved was Garth's left subtree, which became a right subtree of Daisy. Questions about that? Okay. So it's your turn. We have some rebalancing exercises, so I'm going to give you about five minutes to work on this. You can work on it with a neighbor. This is much like you will see on the exam next Thursday, so good practice. So you've inserted 12 into this AVL tree. It's no longer balanced. You need to rebalance it. So you first need to identify the node where the imbalance, the first node where the imbalance occurs, and then you need to rebalance about that node. So 12 has been inserted.
I say, did you give the student the password? Okay. Okay, y'all. Let's uh, let's take a quick look at how we solved this. So, on the test, the first thing you need to do is you start by assigning heights to everything. So, twelve is the inserted value, and its height is zero. The leaves always have heights of zero. Empty trees have heights of minus one. So the height of 16th right child is minus one. There's no imbalance problem there. Okay, so now we go to the parent of 16, which is 10, and its height is one. Okay, and the height of 40 is zero. So there's no problem there. Whoops, there is a problem, sorry. The height here. 16 is 1, so I messed up. I went too fast. Before we get to 10, we go to 16. Well, the height of 16 is 1. The height of 8 is 0. There's only a difference of 1 there, so we're still okay. Now we go to 10. The height of 10 is 2. The height of 40 is 0, and there is a problem. The heights differ by more than 2. So the imbalance is about 20. It's the first node whose two children's height is, differs by more than 1. Okay, so now we have to figure out, so the imbalance is about 20. So imbalance is about 20, is at node 20. Okay, it's the first node whose two, whose two subtrees differ in height by more than one. Okay, so now we have to figure out is it a zigzag or is it a zigzag case? So starting at this imbalance node 20, we have to figure out where 12 was inserted. 12 was inserted into its left subtree because 12 is less than 20. Now we go to 10, and 12 is greater than 10, so it was inserted into 10's right subtree, making it a zigzag case because in traversing the first two levels, we first went left, and then to insert 12, we went right, making it a zigzag. We went in two different directions, which means we have to do a double rotate about the grandchild. Of 20. And that grandchild is what? 16, because it's a zigzag. If it was a zigzag, we would be rotating about the child, which is 10. But it's a zigzag. We rotate about the grandchild. We get to that grandchild by doing a zig and then a zag. We get 16. So we're doing a double rotate about 16. Again, I typically like to do it in two steps. If you want to do it in one full step, that's fine by me. But the first Single rotation is to bring 10 down. So when we bring 10 down, it becomes a left child of 16. 10 keeps its current left child. 
10 adopts 16's left child. Okay, 16 keeps whatever its current right child is, but its current right child is empty. And now we just fill in everything above 16. 16 becomes a left child of 20. 20 maintains its right child. Now that was just the first rotation. We rotate it 10 down. 16 moved up to become a left child of 20. We have to do the second rotation, which is going to move 20 down. So when we move 20 down, it becomes a right child of 16. It holds on to its right child, which was 40. Okay, and that takes care of everything. If 16 had had a right child, okay, if 16 had had a right child, which it did not, but let's say it did, well, then we wouldn't have had the imbalance, <laughs> okay? But that subtree would have ended up going here, okay? There was no subtree, I'm just saying that's where it would have gone had one existed. Okay, so your final answer should look like that. Any questions? Okay, there is a second practice problem. I'm not going to go over it, but it is good practice for the exam. And I would strongly suggest you take a look at it. Guess what? If the first one was a zigzag, there's a good chance the second one gives you practice with zig zig. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this one now, but I strongly suggest before the exam that you go over it. It has the answer. So if you go to AVL rebalancing exercises from today, that will take you to that particular page. Okay. But we need to talk about deletion. So deletion is really, you've got all the tools that you need in order to do deletion. Okay, so the first step in deletion is to treat the tree just like a binary search tree, because in fact, that is what an AVL tree is. It is a binary search tree. So your first step in deletion is to delete using exactly the same set of rules you used when deleting from a binary search tree. And here's an actual review of that. So if the deleted node is a leaf, that's the easy case. So if we have, if we were here and we just deleted boo, that's a leaf, it simply goes away. The second case is where you have a single child. So let's say you deleted Kalista. What happens when you delete a node with a single child? Very good. You promote the child. So if I deleted Kalista, Boo would replace Kalista. Okay. Then the final case is where we have two children. Okay, let's say I deleted Daisy. What do I do when I have two children? Very good. You replace it with the largest node in the left subtree. So if I delete Daisy, the largest node in that left subtree is Kalista. So I first delete Kalista, and I'm guaranteed that Kalista has at most one child. In fact, I'm guaranteed that Kalista cannot have a right child. Why am I guaranteed that Kalista cannot have a right child? Because it's the highest value. If Kalista had a right child, 
that right child would be greater than Callista. So Callista could not, in that case, be the largest value in the left subtree. So we're guaranteed that the largest value in the left subtree does not have a right child. So it's either a leaf or it has a left child. So it reduces to one of the other two cases. So we delete Callista, replacing it with Boo, and then Callista replaces Daisy. So it's the same first step that you would do with a binary search tree. But as a result of doing that, you could be imbalanced. And so we're going to have to check to see if we have some kind of imbalance. Okay? So there are three cases that can occur when we do a delete. Okay? So let's go through the three cases by illustrating. So first of all, let's say that we changed, we deleted boo. It's a very easy delete, but as a result of deleting boo, Callista's height changes. Okay? So Callista's height changed. Because Callista's height changed, there's a potential for an imbalance. So we have to compare Callista's height with the height of the left one, and there is no difference. Okay? But that's not actually the end of this story. Even though there's no difference, we then have to check to see whether there's any height imbalances from here all the way to the root. Okay? In this situation, there is no imbalances. So when we come up here, there's no change to the height. It is still 2. And because there's no change to the height, I know there's going to be no further changes. But at any rate, this is case 1. So its height is decremented by 1. Okay? Case 2 is that we delete a node and the height of the parent does not change. So let's say we change delete Fred. Okay? The height of Luther does not change. It's still 1. This case is the perfect case. The height of the parent did not change, and it is still balanced. Okay? In that case, we are done, because the parent is still a balanced AVL tree. Its height did not change. Because its height did not change, everything above it must still be balanced. So that is the Goldilocks case. It is case two. The height doesn't change, and the tree stays balanced. Okay, so it's case two here. Finally, we have case three, which is the parent's height doesn't change but it does become an imbalanced AVL trait. That happens if we delete D'Antonio. If we delete D'Antonio, Eunice's height does not change. It is still 2. Okay, still 2, but it's now imbalanced because its left subtree is minus 1, its right subtree has a height of 1, so it's imbalanced. And therefore, we have to rebalance. Okay, so three cases. Cases one and three, like in Goldilocks, are not the Goldilocks case. We have to do some rebalancing, potentially. Case two is the Goldilocks case where the tree remains balanced. Okay? So, let's take a look at each of the two types of cases. So, we'll start with the first case. So here's a tree with Daisy, and we're going to delete a mod. Okay? When we delete a mod, 
we are left with the subtree you see here. So you can see a mod has disappeared. You can also see that Binky's height changed from 1 to 0. Binky is still a, the subtree rooted at Binky is balanced by default because Binky is a leaf node. But if we compare Binky and Luther, we see their heights differ by 2. So even though we, um, Binky's remains itself a balanced AVL tree, the fact that Binky's height changed means we still have to compare Binky's height with its sibling's height, and there's a problem. The heights differ by more than two, so we have to rebalance. Now, we have to again determine do we have a zigzag case or a zigzag case. And it's not as simple as with insertion. With insertion, you had a value that you had inserted into the tree. You could use that value to determine whether you had a zigzag or zigzag case because you took that value and you compared it with the imbalance node and you would go either left or right. But we don't have an inserted value here. And we cannot use the deleted value. Okay? In fact, where the imbalance occurs is on the opposite side of the tree. We delete it from the left side, but the imbalance is now, whoops, on the right side over here. So we definitely cannot use a mod to determine where the imbalance occurs because we're looking down Daisy's right tree. So what we're now looking at is heights. So first of all, we go in the direction of the imbalance. Okay, the tree with the greater height. So the tree with the greater height is Luther, so we go right. Now, the imbalance is going to be in the tree that has the greater height. So we are going to go left, okay, so go left, if left height, left subtree is higher than right subtree, we go right if the right subtree's height is greater than the left subtree. Okay, and you're saying, but wait a minute. The two subtrees have equal height, which means we can go either way. So if they are equal, if subtrees have equal height, we go in the direction that creates a zig-zig case. Why do you think we go in the direction that creates a zig-zig case? We have a choice. We're making a choice in favor of zig-zig. Why? It's more efficient. Very good. We care about efficiency. A zigzag only requires a single rotation. A zigzag requires a double rotation. So the zigzag is more efficient. So given a choice with equal sized or equal height, not equal sized, equal height subtrees, we will go in the direction that gives us a zigzag. So what direction does that mean we're going to go in this case? We already went to the right because the higher subtree was to the right. So from Luther, Luther's two subtrees have equal height. We're going to the right because we want a zig-zig. 
So if we have a zigzag and the imbalance node is daisy, what are we going to rotate about? Luther. Very good, because Luther is the child of daisy. So when we do that, notice, so daisy is going to become the left child of Luther. Daisy keeps Binky as its left child. Daisy adopts Eunice, it's his subtree, as its right child. And Luther continues to hold on to Lyugi as its right child. Okay, so that's case number one where the we deleted a node, so to review, we deleted a mod. As a result of deleting a mod, its parent's height changed, but it was still a balanced AVL tree. So that was case one, but we still had to compare, and we found that the heights of Binky and Luther differed by more than two, so there was an imbalance and we had to rebalance. Now, this is very important. When we are finished rebalancing the subtree, unlike the insert case, there is no guarantee that the height of that rebalanced subtree is going to be the same height. Okay? It should make sense because with insert, we were increasing the height of the tree, and by rebalancing, we were simply getting the height back from H plus 1 back to H. But that's not the case with delete. With delete, we're deleting something from the tree. It is very possible that the height of the rebalanced tree will go from H to H minus 1, in which case, even after the rebalancing, farther up the tree, there still may be an imbalance. That is, it would be possible that after rebalancing at Daisy, so that Luther now replaced Daisy. Notice that the height of Luther is 2, it is not 3. So if there was more stuff here, which there isn't, but if there was more stuff, let's say that the height of this node had been 4, well now we would still have an imbalance right here. So we cannot stop once we have rebalanced Luther. Once we've rebalanced Luther, we must compare Luther with its sibling because there still may be a height imbalance. So with deletions, we may actually get multiple rebalancing operations as we go to the root. We can't stop after two either. I can create pathological situations where I'm going to have basically a rebalance at every node from essentially the deleted leaf all the way to the root. It would happen very rarely. A special type of tree would be required, but I could create such a tree that essentially would require roughly log in rebalancing operations. I will not be that cruel on an exam. Okay. Now, there's another case. Okay, this was just the first case. Okay, let's consider the other case, case three, where we delete a node and the height of the tree is going to not change, but it's going to be in balance. So, we will try a simple case where we delete Kalista. It doesn't change the height of Binky, but nonetheless, Binky becomes imbalanced. This is case three. We make the exact same um, search strategy for determining whether we have a zigzag or a zigzag case. Starting at the imbalanced node, and it will be the parent node that is imbalanced. So we will go down the opposite subtree. So we'll start by going down the left subtree. And just like we did before, 
When we reach the child, we will look at the child's left subtree and the child's right subtree. In this case, it's empty. And we'll determine which of the two subtrees has the greater height. In this case, the left subtree has the greater height. So we have a zig-zig situation. Okay. In a zig-zig situation, we rebalance about the child. So we will rebalance about baby Daisy. And we come up with this tree. Okay. Let's try a more complicated example. So let's say we delete Eunice from this tree. Well, Eunice has two children. So we first treat it like a binary search tree, and we find the largest child in Eunice's left subtree, which is D'Antonio. So we're going to delete D'Antonio, and Eunice will be replaced with D'Antonio. So we start, and we've deleted D'Antonio, and before we um, replace Eunice with D'Antonio, we need to rebalance. So Eunice's height is still 2 after the deletion, but it's imbalanced because the height of its left subtree is minus 1, the height of its right subtree is 1. So we go to the greater of the two subtrees heights, which is the right subtree. Then at Luther, we look at the greater of the heights of the two subtrees, and the greater height is the left subtree. So what situation do we have? A zigzag or a zigzag? Zigzag. So what are we going to do our double rotation about? Fred, the grandchild of Eunice. So when we do that double rotation, Fred, first of all, Luther becomes a right child of Fred there. And then Eunice becomes a left child of Fred. So we end up with this subtree, and we still have one more thing to do with Eunice. We deleted Eunice and replaced it with D'Antonio. So the final operation is D'Antonio replaces Eunice. Now, we still, it's possible that the height of the subtree would have changed. In this case, it did not. The original, whoops, it did. It went from 2 down to 1. Okay? But it is still in alignment with Binky, meaning that the heights differ by no more than 1. And so in this case, we would um, We would be done, but you would still probably need to go and check the parent. It's always safe to go up and check the parent. So even though the difference here is 1, you would still actually need to go and check the parent and on up to the root. Okay? I am not going to do it today, but we will do it on Tuesday. Thank you. On Tuesday we're going to try to delete Xerxes from this particular subtree. Actually, we're going to delete Xerxes from this subtree, and we're going to find it's a case where we need to do two rotations to rebalance. So I want to show you an example where one rotation is not enough to rebalance, where we have to do two rotations. Okay. And... Just a moment, just a moment, just because I want to make sure you all realize this. There is a quiz on Canvas today, so make sure you finish it by Saturday. Okay, so there is a Canvas quiz today. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Remember, intermediate lab deadline is Saturday. So, Saturday, I'm sorry, Friday evening, Saturday morning.